Good morning, family. I say good morning, family. Turn to somebody to your left and to your right. Say, welcome to the college of the firstborn. Come on, come on. Talk to another person. Say, welcome to the college of the firstborn. Tell another person, welcome to the assembly and the assemblage of the firstborn. Tell another person, welcome to the, co the conclave of the firstborn. <laughs> Tell another person, welcome to the rulership of the firstborn. Tell somebody, this is about me in God. This is about me in God. Glory to God, I'm excited. We're still dealing with the, oh, you want to clap, you want to clap. Good to do. This is about me, this is about me. You know, as a pastor, I, I don't know what gives other pastors pleasure in the work. The greatest pleasure I have in the work is a, one of the greatest pleasures that I have in the work I, is the pleasure of having revelation, a trajectory of the revelation that is given to you and it's so beautiful and you know what this will do in people's life and you wake up daily and you walk in this and you, and you come to reveal it and, and you know that somebody's life and status is being changed forever. This season is just an amazing season. Last week I told you how God literally brought me back to how we started this year in February about the mystery of the firstborn. And God had told me, you're not going to let go on this revelational trajectory um, for a while. You're going to stay there. So even though we got into other things about Easter, about uh, the resurrection, about the mystery of the resurrection and the the the, the the descent of the Holy Ghost, the sending of the Holy Ghost, and we got involved with, the, with all other things in the spiritual warfare uh, projects. But the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 no. Tell them they are firstborn. Just tell them. Tell them. God asked me literally to tell you that he does not have two sons. It, God is not the God of the firstborn and the second son, you know, like Abban Yudo. There is no concept of Udo in the, call, in the kingdom of God. There is no concept. There is no understanding. There is, no, there is no understanding of the concept of Udo's second son in God. There is none. None. Everyone is first. Now, that does not take away the issue of chronos, the issue of chronology, like who came first and who comes first. When we talk about firstborn, we are not talking about the chronos of it. In terms of the chronological arrangement, who are who came first in the family, or who was born again first, or who came into Christ first? That's not what the scripture is talking about. When the scripture is talking about firstborn, it is a revelation about status. The firstborn is about status, it's about inheritance. It's, in, it's about inheritance. What the scripture is saying, it's saying in Hebrews, let's quickly go into this. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be staying with, hanging out with this scripture and hanging around this scripture for quite a long time. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 to 24. But you have come to Mount Zion. And I talked to you about the ecclesia. The ecclesia to, to who? The, the called out of God. The ecclesia of God. The church of God. The church of God. The ecclesia to, to who? Those who are called out. Called out unto God. But you have come to Mount Zion. This is what the scripture is going to do here, or what the scripture is doing here, is the contrasting. <clears throat> the contrasting of the mystery of the first one in the, new, in the New Testament. The mystery of the church. The scripture is contrasting the revelation about the church and what happened on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19 and chapter 20 and going forward. The theophany, technically called in theology, the self-showing of God, the self-revelation of God, the self-giving of God to people in revelation so that people felt God in the quaking of the mountain, in the shaking, in the earthquaking and the shaking of the mountain, in the blackness of the cloud, in the, the terrorizing, searing sound of the trumpet blast, in the presence of God on the mountain. So there is a contrast. That we are, you have not come to a place that causes your bone to crack and your soul to melt out of fright and terror. You are not coming into the place of unfriendly 
unfriendliness and strangeness that will cause you to tell God to speak from a distance. So when you're going to be, when you talk about the firstborn then, you're talking about the intimacy, the closeness. The firstborn, the, the, the very first that comes to the father and the mother, it, it, it becomes the sign of sure. The whole attention of everyone is upon that one. So it's, the scripture is contrasting the strangeness and the alienness, the farawayness of Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, 20 going forward. And the closeness and the nearness of our status, of our belonging in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, literally every boundary for he is our peace. The one who by his through his body has broken down the, the boundary, the walls, the separating walls, the discriminating walls that stood against Jews and Gentiles. And he has made us into one by the blood of his cross. Mm. So this is a contrast. So Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 22 is painting the, is painting the picture of contrast, different, so that you know the Old Testament. Yes, and the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament carried, struck a chord of terror, a distance. God was literally distant. And man did not have the facility, the, man did not have the faculty, man did not have the ability to be near to God. And those who were near to him, um, it was not, it was such a beautiful experience, but a beautiful, frightening experience because of the awe of God. Man had not had lost the original, the original innocence. Man had lost the covering of God as a result of which God was one with man. Man was now in the nakedness of the flesh. And the presence of God was both a consolation and a torment. So, but the New Testament, eventually, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And in verse 14, the word became flesh. So the word came back in the flesh, brought God home, such that those who are born of God in the flesh, who, those who are born of God through the word in the flesh, then they now in the flesh of God in the Son can meet God in the flesh and be at home with God in the flesh. So fright is taken away, fear is taken away, or horror and terror, that the presence of God is no longer frightening. The presence of God is no longer intimidating. The presence of God is, is beautiful, is comforting, is glorious, is healing, is everything. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. That's the dwelling of the living God. So the church and the mystery of our salvation is a mystery of the dwelling of God. In the next assembly, we begin a big series this morning. And I want to challenge you to love yourself enough to give yourself additional gift so you listen on the on planet 101.1 fm or just log on to christ the christ radio and make sure you begin to connect the new series we're going to be talking about god's presence the unveiling of the mystery of god's presence i have not seen anything so exciting as that it just literally melts everything inside of me because of the joy and the pleasure of knowing that I'm going to be talking about the presence of God. Glory to God. I'm so excited even as I talk about it. In verse 23, you, are, you, have, you, are, you have come to the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of, company of angels. Glory to God. This is too deep for us to go into. Let's just move on. To the general assembly. Glory to God. I love this word, general assembly. I love this word, General Assembly. Pay attention to the General Assembly. What is it that is said about the General Assembly? Church as the General Assembly is church of the firstborn. You see, there is a church of the clergy. That's not the General Assembly. There is a church of the, the few selected, privileged few retreating as general overseers, retreating as bishops. Retreating as bishops and apostles. And they are known as apostles. They are known as teachers and preachers. And if you are not one of them, you cannot be there. That's not the general assembly. That's the church of the title. That is a church of that is a church of human hierarchical arrangement. But Jesus Christ, the scripture is talking about the church in its native nature, the church in its primitive nature, the church in its bare level is a general assembly, whether you are ordained or not ordained. 
whether you are called into one special ministry or you are not called into any ministry at all just for the sake of being called out and accepted the call to be separated from darkness to be separated from from hell to be separated from the economy and the government of satan just because you accept the invitation into the life of christ you are into the general assembly and everyone in that assembly ordained and non-ordained wealthy and not so wealthy educated and not so educated elites or common folks everyone in that assembly in that general assembly is what firstborn this is the beauty of it it's a general assembly status this is who a child of god is in his primitive level when i mean the, i use the word primitive without any form of refinement before somebody is now refined to be this or to be that before somebody is now anointed to be this or to be that before somebody is now schooled and taught to be this and to be that the original primary status of one who accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior by that very fact and being filled with the Holy Ghost is that you have moved from the common into the general common the evil common, the evil assembly of those who are damned, those who are going to hell, those without God, strangers and aliens to the presence and the economy of God and the blessings of God. You have entered into a general space where everyone in that person has one batch. And the batch there, you don't see any difference between the apostles. And can I tell you something? Well, I don't know whether everybody's going to agree with me or everybody will like this, but what I would like to say, whether somebody is an apostle in that place or a prophet prophet or anything in that place somebody is a firstborn okay and we said last week and for us to know why is this firstborn thing so important exodus chapter 13 and verse 1 to 2 before you get to exodus chapter 13 verse 1 to 2 i just want you to make ownership of something rise to your feet and lift up your two hands Say, without any qualification of my own. No, no, speak it like it's, it's personal to you. Say, without any qualification of my own. Without any goodness of my own. My birth in Christ gives me the status. And gives me the badge. And gives me the honor of the firstborn. Say, without anything of my own. Without fasting or prayer, my birth in Christ gives me a place as God's firstborn, endows me with the opportunity and the privileges and the rights of the firstborn. Say, I am God's firstborn in Christ Jesus. By my very membership, in the body of Christ it is not a matter of denomination it's not about whether I am here or there it is because I'm in Christ Jesus so in the name of Jesus Christ I fully take ownership I fully take responsibility I fully appropriate and I fully enjoy the blessings of the firstborn in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So the reason of this firstborn thing, the importance of it is Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13 and verses 1 and 2. This is the, this is the whole thing, the whole deal about it. Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord God, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, consecrate to me all the firstborn not some all the firstborn so what what is at the core of firstborn we talked about it last week is consecration separation we shall come to the the the, the key of consecration in unlocking when we're talking about unlocking the blessings of the firstborn we are just trying to reveal the mystery of the firstborn there is this there is a mystery a mystery means coded knowledge hidden knowledge, hidden reality that needs to be unveiled 
in revelation for people to know. That's what we are dealing with. That it will come a time in this series that we talk about unlocking the blessings. Unlocking the blessings of the firstborn. So we shall begin to talk about the key of consecration and the key of sacrifice, the key of responsibility and other keys. But first of all, let's just enjoy the mystery. Let's get to know, let's get to have a handshake with the mystery called firstborn. He said, you shall consecrate to me the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel. This is at the physical level. In the Old Testament, the physical things represented the spiritual things. So in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the basic thing about the Old Testament is how the unknown, the unseen God manifested himself in physical, tangible expressions such that the physical things that people could relate with spoke of the mystery of the God that was unseen. So when God is saying here, yeah, you, the firstborn of everything that opens the womb, everything, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, the people of Israel understood this because they were agricultural, agricultural people. They were, they were nomad, nomad, they were shepherds. They were people of the land and people of flocks, people of, you know, moving from one place to another with animals. And they were nomadic and they were, they were people of the soil also. So they understood about what it means to plant and wait. And when you are planted and you are waiting, that the very first gives you so much pleasure because it satisfies your hunger. It brings you fulfillment for the labor and the sacrifice of planting. But God says that one belongs to me in the, in the first fruit arrangement. Then whatever opens the womb, that's the delight. Opens the womb of a woman that is the delight of both the woman and the man. Everybody has been waiting to see how this will be. God says, this, this is mine. And in this, the same thing in livestock. In livestock, whatever opens the womb. So this, is, this speaks, speaks deeply. This speaks deeply. And we shall go through it in a, a short while. Exodus chapter 22 and verse 29. Exodus chapter 22, 29. We have mentioned these scriptures last week. I'm just going through them to glean some new insights that God is giving. You shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and your juice. This is a matter of your juices. This is the matter of urgency. This is something of priority and urgency. That means living the life of the firstborn is not something you say, okay, when I grow a little bit older, or when I marry, I settle down, or when I have a job, uh, okay, when I have means of livelihood, I shall begin to live a life of consecration and that of belonging to God and being the pride of God, being the honor and the wonder of God. It is a matter of urgency. It's a no delay. The kingdom is no delay thing. Just guys, in Mark chapter 1, when he came, uh, you know, Mark is the gospel of urgency. Mark does not have time to talk about the genealogy of Jesus and the, the story of the birth of Jesus that is called infant, infant whatever narrative <laughs> you know he's talking about him you know from the time of pregnancy and all of that mark does not have that time mark goes straight to the point after he was baptized he came to galilee <laughs> let's look at mark chapter 1 verse 13 14 15 let's look at mark chapter 1 verses 13 14. and he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted by satan and was with wild bees and the angels many start to him that is after the baptism he was sent led by the holy spirit to be tested to be prepared for the calling now after john was put in prison just came to galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom the gospel of the kingdom and what is the gospel here what is he preaching and saying the time is fulfilled is urgent that's it it is not something we are waiting for is it something to jump into now the time is already now the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand it is urgent it is offered to you so the issue of the firstborn status is something of absolute urgency it's nothing that leaves room for some level of long preparation and cogitation and meditation and um, every other thing to try to see when will i make up my mind he said it is an urgent thing you shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and your juices the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me what was God dealing with here what was God talking about in giving in the gifts 
demanding. This is not a request. This is a law. This is command. It's part of the law. Why did God demand for the first of the sons of the people of Israel? Why did God do that? Because of the status. Because of the status. Because of the status of the firstborn. The firstborn is the one that had the portion that is called double. Say double. We shall go into that one. We begin to talk about, about the blessings of the firstborn. We shall talk about the double portion. And, and then we talk about how do we unlock. So watch out for that. So what is then the meaning of firstborn? How does God, what does God see in the firstborn? And by saying, put aside the firstborn for me, what does that mean? What is the meaning? What is the implication? What is in the status of the firstborn? Ask somebody, what is it in the box of firstborn? Tell somebody. No, come and ask another person. What is it in the box of the firstborn? What is it that is hidden in the basket of the firstborn? What is this firstborn thing? Ask somebody. I shared with you eight things about the first one that I want to refresh your memory about. Prominence. Prominence. The first, the first in line, the first is prominence. Just guys, it's called the first and the last. The first born from the dead. We shall begin to look at Jesus as the first born. Because when we talk about firstborn, we shall come to know that we are talking about the mystery of Jesus Christ. So this is the Christ mystery. But when we talk about the mystery of the firstborn, it's nothing other than the radical entering into the mystery of the Christ, the Son of God, and prominence. You can go ahead and check dictionary and find out what is prominence. What the when we talk about prominent men in the society, who are the prominent members? Who are the prominent members of the society here? Who are the prominent, those who stand above others? Prominence refers to the stand out, the elites, the elite class. It's talking about those who are above others, the, the select people, those who are not general, but they belong to. So when you talk about a prominent member of the community, when you have an occasion, you have a way of honoring them. They stand out. Who are the prominent members of this class? That means those who are the people who have the substance of studiousness and scholarship in this class. Who are those who can receive information, digest information and produce information in the rank of excellence. That is it to have prominent member of the class. Who are the prominent member of staff in the university, the teaching staff. Who are the prominent? There are lecturers that are waiting thing and money. They go to teach children and confuse them and they make things harder. They are the ones who demand more in examination and they teach nothing. They themselves they are not sure of what they are teaching and they are very good at frustrating people. I don't know whether you have ever met people like that. The best of lecturers make things simplest, simplest for you. I've been taught by a couple of people, people who had, who had doctorate degree from, from, from America, from Europe, and from very, very prominent places across, across Europe. The best of them will just come to class and make you love knowledge. I, 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 well, forgive me if I mention the name of one of my best and favorite lecturers. In the in the seminar in philosophy department, S S no Ruka no Ruka, one man from one priest from Onisha. I hope he's still alive. Oh, Faran no Ruka, Lord of mercy. He it gave us introduction to philosophy, and it was such a delight to sit in the class and listen to a man. That will just give you a paranormal kind of, you know, gives you a knowledge para, 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 panorama, panorama, yes. You know, pan you, pan you across the world of knowledge. And you just sit down awed and you feel like I'm ready to jump into philosophy. That's such a thing. And his class, I mean his examination, you will have great marks. He made it such a beautiful experience to study for his examination. He enlarged us and made us love the material. I don't want to mention the worst of them. 
God forbid you don't talk about worse things, right? It's not permitted. Let's celebrate what is beautiful. Glory to God. And we have guys who came to confuse us and then use their exams to punish us for not knowing what they are supposed to teach. They punish us. And they are like that in every university. You know, so you can talk about the prominent, the prominent class, the prominence. So when, when we are talking about firstborn, when God says set firstborn apart from me, it means the firstborn is prominent. Firstborn, I, I am God almighty, greater than all. So I, 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 I deserve the prominent, the most outstanding. You see, there is, we will talk about all these things I'm talking about, what we'll be talking about, make sure you note them. We talk about the blessings of the firstborn. We talk about the, the keys to unlocking the blessings of the firstborn. But we have to talk about the mentality of the firstborn. You see, the firstborn thing is not just a status thing alone. It is a lifestyle. You see, somebody who is a professor but moves around the university like a tout will be treated like a tout. I don't know if I, you know, so a royal, a ruler of a, of a kingdom who walks around like one of the, the, the folks in the neighborhood, one of the pickpockets uh, and all of that. The day of arrest, he will be arrested before they now find out, oh, he's actually a royal. And a royal, so sorry, but you behave like a fool. And um, that's it. Prominence. So God is the God of prominence. Whoever belongs to God and is associated with God, it does not matter whether you are Mephibosheth and you are crippled on both feet. Uh, it does not matter what, whether you are Esther and you are an orphan. You have no father, no mother, no sister, no brother, no friend. There is just one person mentioned in connection with Esther, an uncle, no cousin, no brother, no sister. So a lonely girl who just had beauty as companionship and a Mordecai as a watchman. Whether you are that or, a, or who else can we talk about? Whether you are one, one man who was born in pain and they called him what? They called him what? They called him Jabez because he was born in pain. Whoever you are, once you enter into that covenant relationship through the blood of Jesus Christ and become son in Christ Jesus, prominence is invested upon you. You go through the investiture of prominence. Stand up, say investiture. Inve come on, come on. Investiture. Two things about investiture is investment and then divestment. The no, come on, come on. <laughs> Two things about investiture. One is what? Investment. Deposit. Making, making deposit into something. Putting into something. Then what is the other thing? Investment. Investment is the wearing. So investiture is the wearing of investment. You see, the investiture of the college of the prominent is that prominence becomes the, the investment that is put upon them as garments. Uh, wow, glory to God. So once you are born again, the very rights of passage, the very rights of passage is that you are you, you receive the investment of God as vestment. Uh, you receive the investment of might as your vestment. That means might becomes your vestment. That means extraordinariness becomes what you wear. You are draped and gapped and, <laughs> and dressed in prominence. <laughs> Shout prominence. Glory to God. This is what God sees. So God does not see your knocked knee or your bowlet. <laughs> God does not see your big heart. I mean your big head or your broken nose. God does not see your pointed nose or your beautiful crafted um, crafted lips. God does not see your wife or whatever it is. God sees nothing of all of that. God sees the investment of sonship. All that the son went through in incarnation. Being God, he did not see his equality with the father something to be held unto but he emptied himself in kenosis uh, and took the, the the level of a slave and humbling himself still uh, he died uh, and not just death the death of the cross uh, therefore therefore the father has also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every other name all of that refers to the investment uh, that becomes the vestment uh, so I am here here 
carrying the investments as vestments. Well, as a Catholic priest, I understand what is vestment. Maybe you may not know. Vestment is not just that you wear singlets and that you wear another shirt and talking upon one other trouser. That's not vestment. Ask a, a lawyer, ask um, a judge, ask a judge, you will have an idea of what vestment is. Ask a Catholic priest. As orthodox priests, so there is one big garment upon another big garment upon another big garment, three layers, seven layers garments, garments these and garments that, garments that shows itself in the neck. So when a priest finishes, you know, wearing things, there are things you see, there are things you don't see. It begins with the one that is closest to the body, and the other one that covers the body, and then the other one that is now a big display all of this added together they are called vestment they are the investment of dignity all of this apparel they are just about giving a testimony this man may be man but this man carries divine investment and so when he says the Lord be with you there is an expectation in heaven on account of the investment that the Lord will be with you I don't know whether I'm communicating but let me tell you something that is in the order of the Catholic priesthood and you don't need to be a Catholic priest to carry the investment of God as your vestment vestment as in heavy clothes and heavy clothes beautiful garment and beautiful garment what it just takes is that the incarnation of Jesus Christ is a garment <laughs> the sufferings of Jesus another garment the blood of Jesus Christ another garment the wounds of Jesus another garment the dying of Jesus another garment when he said it is finished another garment the burial another garment the stone is rolled the way another garment is not there in the tomb he is another garment there he is ascending to the father another garment seated at the right hand of the father in majesty another garment and I am seated with him in the heavenly places another garment above principalities and powers another garment above names that can be named not only in this age but in the age to come another garment and then the Holy Ghost coming down another garment and splitting in like tongues upon everyone another garment all of this they constitute you into the prominence of God <laughs> that is the investment God had to make to distinguish somebody from somebody so when God says something is mine mean what investment what investment to set what is his own apart from others wow what investment be seated I don't know whether you have ever seen some folks like even among keke on us Let's just talk about keke on us. You know, there are some kekes you see in the night while you are driving. You are intimidated. You think the governor is coming back late. <laughs> like some keke that is uh, luminous. Like he can everywhere. Light. Light on top. <laughs> light inside. Light by the side. So literally, you have to slow down. <laughs> and now then you now know that is a keke. Say, what is not nonsense? Is this keke? You mean you are keke and you intimidated me? He's telling you, I may be a keke, but I'm different from other keke. And if you want to know I'm different, I like coming back in the night. So you see me coming and you know there's different keke is coming back. There's another keke that you just know by the night, by the noise. When keke, keke, and it's passing. And you just know this one is keke. Get out of my sight. But there's a scary, terrifying keke with light. Oh, do you even know that keke has God? Like some kind of protection that if you jam me, you know that something is happening to you. No, so what all these folks, what they are doing is that we may just, we may just, we may be plying the same route in Uyo, but there is prominence. When I put one light and the other one is called investment. Investment to make a keke different from a keke. All right, praise God, praise God. No, wait, wait. When people come for child dedication, you know, you see the level of the econ economic level of the, the people. You see the wife of one. They, they, they go all out, they hair, and, and even the baby and everything, how they look, the uniform, the, syn the synergy in symmetry, and all of that. Then you just see some other guys say, I'm you know, like, 
and all of that. So even in the, you know, somebody's trying to show in all the in accessories uh, such that the woman cannot carry the baby because there are too many gummy, gummy things and all of that. Hooking, hooking things uh, and all of that. He's trying to say, yes, we might all be young wives, uh, but among the young wives, there is a wife among wives. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking to somebody. So to the extent that you have, to that extent you display in what you have. Absolutely not. If you have nothing, you display nothing in what you have. If you have little, you display little. If you have much, you display much. So think about it when God displays in his first one. He said, you all have children, that's okay. They are in the economy of the sun and moon and rain. When the rain falls, it takes care of them. When the sun shines, it takes care of them. But the first, set them apart from me. Let them set them apart for me. And God invests in the first one. So that's what prominence is about. Rise to your feet. <laughs> Say, I am, I am a bundle. I'm a ton, a ton of God's investment. No, I didn't hear. Say, I'm a ton of God's investment. I am, I am, I am a ton of God's investment. Say, I am a heap of God's investment. Say, I am, I am, I am, I am a mountain of God's investment. Say, I am, I am, I am, I am an ocean of God's investment. The blood of Christ is in my hand. Say, the blood of Jesus is in me. The pains that he bore, I carry them. The wounds, the stripes, I carry them. The the nakedness that he had to go through for me to be clothed, I carry them. The thorns in the flesh, the thorns on the head of Jesus, I carry it. His death and death on the cross, I carry it. That is what separates me. That's what sets me apart. Sir, that is the only honor I have. Title is of worthlessness, sir. sir title of men no matter what they don't have value in the spiritual the devil does not value you because you are a cardinal or the devil does not respect you because you are archbishop in the heavenly places there is no separation between bishop and archbishop these are ecclesiastical arrangements for governance of the church they have no spiritual implication except it is the Christ it is the Christ in us that, that makes us the cardinal of God, the focus of God. It is the Christ who the investment of God. So when we talk about firstborn, God says set the firstborn apart for me for I have something about the firstborn. They are mine. So God wanted to build an assembly. God wanted to raise a kingdom. The kingdom that everyone, there is no Udo in the kingdom. There is no Uma in the kingdom. There is no second class in the kingdom. There is no no, there is no third class in the kingdom. I don't know how many people that you know have had first class at the level of academics. But when it comes to God, whether you are educated or not, God calls you first class. You don't belong to God and be second. You don't belong to God and be third. You don't belong to God and be the third. He said you shall be the first and not the last. You shall be the head and not the tail. Oh, so God. So God is the one who gathers nothing into prominence. Where you are coming from is darkness. But when you cross in Christ, you enter prominence. Shall prominence. I speak that the character of prominence will break out like a plague. Let the character of prominence break out like a plague in this assembly. Let the character of the firstborn rest your two hands. Let the blessing, the oil of the firstborn break out let the fragrance of the firstborn break out in this assembly let the character let the nature let the prominence of the firstborn break out like a plague in the name of Jesus Amen. we still have one or two things to say I said there are eight glory to God so when God says set aside or gently do not delay Prominence, that's okay. Preeminence, oh my goodness. 
These are words that are correlated. These are words that are related. These are words that are similar, but carry their peculiar nuance and nuances. Is a pray eminence, <laughs> eminence, eminence, preeminence. Prior among them, eminence, the eminence, eminent citizen is still about the elites, it's still about the aristocratic, it's still about the blue blood, it's still about the royal. This, but there are among the eminent servants, among the eminent dignitaries, among the eminent invited guests, among the eminent people, there are those who are preeminent among the eminence. So the pre eminence uh, it means they carry another cap uh, I don't know what I'm talking to somebody so you may belong uh, in a place where everybody claims to be somebody but there is the pre that you carry pre means before you became eminent I have been eminent <laughs> I don't know when we talk about pre-creation it means before creation. Well, I don't know what I'm talking to somebody. When we talk about pre-civilization, it means before civilization. So if you come to civilization and civilization, they, do, they do, begin to do things like they will remove your eyes. You t tell them pre, before you were in the civilization, I had been there. Before you came in creation, I had been there. It carries preeminence. The scripture talks about Jesus Christ. Let's, let's quickly run so let's quickly do a pleasure a pleasure trip to Colossians chapter 1 and let's look at from verse 12 no from verse 13 from verse 13 and read down he has delivered us oh my goodness he has let's, let's start from verse 11 I love the strengthening that happens in verse 11 strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy this is a prayer and the wish of Paul upon the Colossian church giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us uh, glory to God to be partakers of what the inheritance say inheritance say inheritance God has qualified us before we knew how to fast and pray God qualified us in Christ so is it a pre thing before you started fasting and pray there is praying there is a pre thing that means it is not your ability to fast and pray and do all night meeting with God every night that makes you preeminent above others it is the fact of the qualification of God that's why I talked about the investment of God as your vestment the investment of God as your garment the wearing of all the works of God in Christ. That's why the scripture calls us that we are workmanship of God. So giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the sins in the light. Verse 13 can now make sense. Because he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love glory. So it is in the Son that this preeminence breaks out in whom we have war redemption the price is paid and transaction takes place and we are free from the useless and we are set aside for you stroke his blood the forgiveness of sins records wiped away he read it really loud really loud come on really louder he is the image of war the invisible come on read the next one <laughs> The one who is our redeemer who pays the price with himself, with himself. The one who paid the price with his blood, with his death on the cross, is firstborn. This is your nativity. This is your foundation. This is the place of your birth. This is your family spirit. This is your familiar spirit. That in him... You have found redemption, even the forgiveness of your blood. And you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the waters, the kingdom of the ancestral, the kingdom of territorial demons, into the, the kingdom of his beloved, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. He is, now we are beginning to Tangoto. We are doing the citation. Few places in the New Testament that citation is made of Jesus and I love it. 
I love it in Ephesians chapter 1. I love it in Colossians chapter 1. And it's just such a beautiful thing. I also love it in Hebrews chapter 1. You know, it's just talking the citation. I don't know if you have been there. When professors do their, their, their inaugural lectures, and one person just takes the responsibility of spending like 15, 30 minutes to do citation. When sickness comes to you, do you do citation of your origin? When Satan shows up to, to insult you, what do you do? You cry? Or you look for a prophet? Or you do citation? of your redemption and the deliverance or you do the citation of your salvation and their savior or you do the ci citation like presenting the profile of your redemption and your salvation because the scripture says in him we are complete nothing is lacking because he because he, he pleased the father that the fullness of divinity the fullness of Godhead will manifest in him and dwell in him natively naturally and in the flesh and in him who is the fullness of God we carry fullness it means in the fullness of God I am full come on when you know the citation of your redemption you know the citation of who you are as a redeemed Come on. When you know the citation of your salvation and your savior, you know your citation of the one who is saved. So there are certain things you go into fasting and prayer that does not need fasting and prayer. It just needs citation. Just talking about it. There are certain warfare. You don't need to, you know, you don't need to start shouting. You just, that's what I do in warfare. That's what I do every day. I spend one or two hours doing citation. 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 That's why the more you know, the more you talk. The less you know, the less you talk. And if you know nothing, you talk nothing. And then you look for somebody who will talk on your behalf. And you go back to native doctor experience. So a lot of people being Christian is about being, being in a new form of native doctorship. A new form of, of um, pagan life. That they don't know their salvation. They don't know the rock from whom they have been hewn. They, know, they don't know about their redemption and their salvation. So they have no utterance. They have no talking about their salvation. And so when issues come to conflict with them and to stand in the way of their salvation, they look for a man or a woman first of all, who has to say something. Say something. The something to be said is in your mouth. Moses said the word is not far from you. The word is in your mouth. And Paul referring, talking to the Romans said this word is not far. The word is within you. If you will believe with the heart, you believe unto what? Justification. But if you confess with your mouth the word of salvation, you shall be what? Look at the citation again. Verses 13, 14. He is the image of the invisible. Now take me back to 14. Don't, hurry, don't, don't rush me. Don't do that. In whom we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of his sins. Beautiful. Next verse. He is the image of the, inv uh, the invisible God. Complete it. What does that mean? The prominence of God over all creation. The preeminence of God over all creation. It means when things happen at the creational level, you can say, shut up. And if somebody says, objection, you say, before time began, I was there. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. Through him, all things were made. By him and for him. All things were made through him. Nothing was made that had been made except by him. So creation, shut up. Any more objections? Say not at all. You are the creator. The first principle, the power by which God spoke. You are the one who in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, God said, let there be light. And because you went forth, light came running. Glory to God. So this is what the scripture is talking about. Say, you are the firstborn over all creation. Say, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Verse 15, come on. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over what? Not over some creation. Firstborn means preeminent. If there is anything in nature that rises against you, there is one who enjoys preeminence. Before cancer became cancerous, he had been there. 
He has power before cancer. He has power before Lucifer. He has power before Satan. He has power before principalities and power. He has power before territorial spirit. He has power before ancestral spirit. He has power before the marine spirit. He has power. He enjoys preeminence. In the assembly of powers, he enjoys power before power. It is because of him that there are powers. It is because of him because that there are principalities. If you read down, you'll discover that every principality, every power takes existence uh, and prominence from him. That means he carries preeminence. <laughs> and when you are firstborn, you are the official representation of that preeminence. Uh, so, how does God govern over principalities and power? Christ in us, the hope of glory. It is by Christ in us that God is still showing Satan that you lost your power in heaven and you did not have enough power to resist and you were cast out. Let me show you how you will be cast out again. A little child of God, in the name of Jesus. I command you get out of this place. And a child of God may swell up and say, I cast out the one. It's not true. It's Christ in us. <laughs> the hope of glory. He is the preeminence. The good thing is this. Because you carry Jesus as the investment, as your investment, as vestment. Am I communicating? Because the Father has invested Jesus upon you and you wear him because we are clothed in Christ Jesus. Because you are clothed in Christ, who is the investment of the Father in his incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection? He is the totality, completeness, and perfection of the Father's investment. So in Christ Jesus, you can say, I enjoy firstborn status over all creation. So you can order nature. You can order the river to go back. You can order the waves be still. So when he was in the boat, and the disciples were fretting, and they were afraid, and said, carest thou not that we go down here. And he woke up and he looked at the sea. He said, how dare you? How dare you? You should have been told that the one who carries preeminence over all creation is in this world. So he said, ha, be still. And everything was calm again. And he said, what kind of man is this? That's who you are. That's what you were born for. That's what it means to be born again. To enter into the place where you can speak to the forces of nature. You speak to things that are wild and dangerous. Things that devour and kill. Things that destroy without mercy. Things that people are afraid of. And it comes your way. And you say, in the name of Jesus, be still. And it is still. Say, I take your voice from you. And he no, longer, he no longer speaks. I take your sword from you. You can no longer cut. I take your teeth from you. You can no longer bite. I take your fang, your poison, your venom from you. You can no longer sting. Why? As firstborn in Christ, you enjoyed preeminence. Before Satan became satanic, you were there in Christ. For the mystery of our salvation dates back to the foundation of the world. For the scripture says, the Lamb of God that had been slain before the foundation, whenever he had been Lord, from that time your prominence began because he had been Lord having you in mind that one day you will be begotten. And that's why Paul said that this mystery that has been hidden from the prophets, uh, have been hidden from the holy men of old, but are now, now made, made known to us. So this thing that I'm talking about, angels long to look into these things. Uh, Elijah and Elisha, they try to gaze into this thing. Joshua operated, but not in this dimension. Elijah operated, but not in this dimension. They were operating from the shadow and the place of distance, but we are not operating from a distance and shadow. We are operating, it is in him we live, we move and have a being. For we are, if any man be in Christ Jesus, not far away from Christ Jesus, not anticipating Christ Jesus, for if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is what? A new creation. So I'm not in the same order 
order of Elijah. I'm not in the same order of Elisha. I am not sure God wants to use me to do the things that Elijah did. God wants to use me to do the things that Elisha did. As mighty as they were, God has gone past the Elijah level. God has gone past the Elisha level. <coughs> At the time of Elijah and Elisha, God had made some investment upon the kingdom. But it was not the investment that he has made in the Christ. By that time, the world had not become flesh. The world had not been crucified. And the world had not been buried. And the world had not risen from the dead. And the world had not ascended to represent humanity. So that if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. is a heavenly creation. For he seated in Christ above that aboveness is a state is a status so I'm not expecting God to use me to do what Elijah did I'm not expecting God to use me to do what Elisha did I'm not expecting God to use me at the level of Elisha and Elijah there is something that I know in the scripture you see you do the things that I do why I am firstborn and you are firstborn in me but that's not all I give you authority. Move further. The things I did not do because I did not have time. I came, I came to raise you. I came to prepare you. All the things I'm supposed to do in every generation. Newer things that have never been known. What the scripture says, eyes have not seen. I don't know you are still sitting. I don't know who is your father and your mother. I don't know where are you going to. Is it the same God that I know? That in come and rise on your faith. You say you will do the things I do. Why? I am firstborn. That is why I command nature. As firstborn in me, the firstborn. You will command nature in the tech age. At the time of Jesus. People needed one year to travel from one place to another. People needed years to move from one continent to another. But in the time of the Christ that we live. In this tech age of instant messaging of instant notification of instant direct message of instant video stops at this moment so who is going to command who is going to do the things that Jesus did not do because when he commanded nature technology had not reached this level we are the generation of doing the things more more than what he did every generation makes demand for more anointing every generation makes demand for the revelation of the sons of God at higher level lift up your two hands say I agree I accept the status in Christ Jesus I am first born over creation I am first born over technology I am first born over addiction I am first born over above gadgets I'm first born I'm first born above moon and sun and rain I'm first born above economy I am first born above all economic issues I am first born against all gynecological issues all issues related to fertility and health and maternal health and paternal health and ministerial power say so I accept responsibility of the firstborn say I don't shy away from my status I don't know wherever you are lift up your two hands say Jesus Christ this is an urgent thing I submit to you take away my sin take away things of the ancestors take away things of the territory take away things of the culture take away things of tradition take away things of human knowledge take away things of human arrogance take loss from me take impurity from me take impurity from me take insanity from me take rebellion from me I receive you as God's investment I receive you for my purity say Lord Jesus I receive you as my holiness I receive you as my justification I accept you as my salvation say I take responsibility as firstborn say Lord Jesus you are God's investment and I wear you as my investment 
you are God's investment in my life. I wear you as my vestment. I wear you in my relationship. I wear you in my marriage and my case is different. I wear you in my relationship and my case is different. I wear you in my life and my case is different. I wear you in my business and my case is different. I wear you in my office and my case is different. Wherever my name is called, it is the investment of the Son that answers for me. The blood of Abel was crying for the Father's vengeance, but the blood of Jesus is speaking better things than that of Abel. The blood of Jesus is speaking better things, louder things, more glorious things than that of Abel. Prostrate is healed. Lay hand on sickness. <laughs> Say in Christ Jesus, I enjoy prominence above all creation. Say in Christ Jesus, I am firstborn over all creation. Prostrate be reversed, cancer be reversed, tumor disappear in Christ Jesus. I enjoy prominence in Christ Jesus. I enjoy aboveness in Christ Jesus. I enjoy superiority in Christ Jesus. I enjoy eminence and preeminence, prominence. I enjoy excellence. I am God's excellency over creation. Darkness, you cannot stop me. The wind, you cannot stop me. The storm, you cannot stop me. Nothing in creation. For who is it that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Can nature separate us? Can the sword separate us? Can demons separate us? Can sickness separate us? Can misunderstanding separate us? As I speak, darkness is leaving your soul. As I speak, addiction is broken in your soul. As I speak, chains are broken in your soul. As I speak, darkness goes. As I speak, addiction with us as I speak shame disappears as I speak cancer dries up wounds and injuries as I speak the hurting hearts are healed as I speak the name of Jesus is exalted exalted above everything exalted above ulcer and cancer exalted above divorce and breaking exalted above penury and insolvency exalted above bankruptcy and poverty raise your voice as speaker as I speak the potency of a man who had been going through impotence ah there is restoration at the genital level there is restoration at the marital level there is restoration at the heart level there is alabosat lay your hand where they need you need the preeminence where you need the prominence malabra sakato I don't know who is speaking in tongues. Come up here. Malabo Shakanda. Generation Kalabasha. After generation. Malabra Shakatayakata. Keep praising you. Kalabra Kata. Maralabo Shandala Katayala Brasata. And I ask the Lord. Kalamasia Kata. What name fits you? Kalibras Nandosata. And he said, Yeah. Raise your voice and speak. Malabra, lay your hand where there is healing right now. Lay your hand where there is deliverance right now. Lay your hand where there is change right now. Lay your hand. Command nature as a child of God. Arise and shine for your light has come. Command your heart to be steady. Command your blood to be steady. Command your blood pressure. Command your blood pressure to be steady. Command nature. He spoke to the wind and the wind was stilled. He spoke to the waves and the waves stood. He spoke to the sea and the sea obeyed. Speak to something as a child of God. You don't need to have been born again for 20 years. You just need to accept Jesus Christ. Now I'm beginning to speak exercise dominion. Malabo Shakata. Yeah. Alaboshia Kandala Brasikata. A generation. Alaboshia Alabra. Turn it into worship. Turn it into worship. As you worship, let the spirit fall. Let the grace fall. Let it glorify. One name's 
prophet you and he said yeah general 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 generation Sing it. Two hands. Let the spirit of the firstborn. Let the spirit of the firstborn. Let the spirit of the firstborn come upon you. Lift up those two hands and wave. And let the spirit of the firstborn come upon you. Say amen. Let the holiness of the firstborn come upon you. Let the character of the firstborn come upon you. Let the marks of the firstborn come upon you. Let the prominence of the firstborn come upon you. Let the preeminence of the firstborn come upon you. Let the excellence of the firstborn come upon you. Let the priority and the ability of the firstborn come upon you. Let the favor of the firstborn come upon you. Say this week, I showcase the first rank of the firstborn. Say this week, I cannot do anything less than the value of the firstborn. Say this week, urgently, I am separated from evil. I'm separated from sin. Mention the things you are separated from. Because you are firstborn, you are separated. Say, I live a separated life. I live a consecrated life. I live a prominent and preeminent life. worship Yahweh the King of Zion Yah the hallowed one and Yah the holy one Yahweh I separate you from destruction Whatever is falling this week to crush, you are separated from it. Whatever is going down in shame and in flame this week, you are, you are separated from it. I separate you from, from darkness, from the sword, from the gunshots. I separate you from what kidnaps, what robs, what assaults, what molests, what rapes, what violates, what infiltrates and corrupts. I separate you. I separate you from snares and traps. I separate you from the grave and death. I set you apart in this house as God's firstborn. By the authority of this call, I set you apart preeminent and for prominence. In Christ Jesus, you are both creation. Things are subject to you. In Jesus' name. Clap those hands now.